Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. <laughs> I'm Julia Patrick, joined today by LaShonda Williams. LaShonda is one of the brain trusts over at Fundraising Academy at National University, and she comes to us from Texas, where she's going to give us her best take on some of these amazing questions that have come in. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors who allow us to be here day in and day out. And LaShonda, every once in a while I say this, but I want to remind everyone that our sponsors have no editorial pressure on us. Um, they don't ever see these questions or the content. They don't get involved in this. They have, it's almost like, you know, how we, we've been talking about philanthropic trust. You know, they have yes. editorial trust in us. And so um, sometimes we bring on their competitors. Sometimes we say things that they don't agree with. I mean, but it's really profound to know that our sponsors really have a hands-off laissez-faire approach to what we do and those people include bloomerang american nonprofit academy your part-time controller nonprofit thought leader fundraising academy at national university where our friend lashonda comes from staffing boutique nonprofit nerd and nonprofit tech talk these are the folks like i said that are with us day in and day out okay we have a super cool thing we have a new app and if you scan even just off of this frame that you're watching, if you're watching us, um, you can access us through our new app and our team here at American Nonprofit Academy created this super cool thing. Um, so check us out. We're really proud of it and it's a great way to feel connected to what the big topics are, what we're talking about and what our community is talking about. You can also connect with us on our podcasts. You can download any of our audio files or streaming broadcasts where you can see us, see what we look like and not just what we sound like. Sometimes that's a little scary, but it's the way. Hey, LaShonda, this is a really cool thing. And if you wouldn't mind talking about it just quickly about Cultivate 2023 that Fundraising Academy is hosting and of all places, wah, wah, San Diego. Well, Cultivate will be a wonderful opportunity for those that are in the philanthropic space that want to learn more about how to cultivate relationships and to garner additional philanthropic support for their organizations. We have been planning a wonderful full day conference that will include two tracks. There'll be a leadership track and then also a track for those that are relatively new to the nonprofit sector that want to learn more. We have a wonderful lineup of topics, discussions, and speakers. And to find out more, we're asking you to use your QR code, scan it, and to go ahead and get registered. Uh, registration is happening through the end of the month, I want to say, into the first part of May, the sooner the better. We had an opportunity to share that information as well at AFP ICON with those that had the opportunity to attend our sessions. So this is definitely the conference that you do not want to miss. We have some wonderful things for you as we cultivate and inspire to learn more in the nonprofit space. It's going to be really cool. And we're going to be there in the nonprofit show broadcasting. And then I think LaShonda, um, so that's on a Thursday. I think we're going to stay um, for Friday, do our ask and answer. And we're kind of kicking around doing more of a round table where we have more than just one representative from Fundraising Academy. So we're kind of playing with that, but we'll be there for two days. And so again, we'd love to see you there. Um, and oh my gosh, San Diego, June 1st, it's the best. It's absolutely the best. And the timing is absolutely impeccable. As you said, you can stay through the weekend and enjoy the wonderful <laughs> weather in San Diego. It's amazing. It's just like, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, let's get started. Um, Claudia from Los Angeles, California has written in. I'm thinking about applying for a job in marketing with a local nonprofit. I'm wondering if it would be a good idea to volunteer before applying or if this would send the wrong message. This is an interesting question. I appreciate yeah. your feedback on this. Um, that's very interesting. Um, there's a lot to that. So I can probably dissect it. First and foremost, if you're interested in career changes, volunteerism is a great way to identify if it's something that you want to do permanently. So I definitely would recommend volunteering in a capacity that you're interested in learning more in and that you're interested in becoming involved in as a full-time basis. Um, many of you may not know that I began my nonprofit work with my National Alumni Association, and I was a volunteer for many, many years before I entered the field full-time as a fundraising professional. So that 
that is a great idea. However, I'm not certain about um, the look or the impropriety it would have if you're volunteering at the organization you're seeking to learn more about. What I would do is suggest that perhaps you may want to have a quasi discovery meeting prior to applying and letting them know that you're interested, be very transparent, that you'd like to know more about the organization. Because as you know, the key to any successful relationship is transparency. And the last thing that you'd like is to look unauthentic in volunteering and having an underlying motivation. So be very forthcoming with that. Mm -hmm. I love, love, love that. And I, I struggled with the answer on this as well because I, I kind of came at it from holy moly, marketing is always understaffed. And if they right. had a professional that came in and said they'd volunteer, it'd be like, yay team. But I love, love, love what you said about the value of building a sound foundation of any relationship, starting with trust and transparency. Um, so yeah, really interesting. It's really interesting. And and I also think, think you used an interesting word discovery and being transparent about that and saying, hey, I would like to, you know, look at a deeper relationship, you know, a working relationship, um, but is there an opportunity for volunteerism? It might be volunteerism in a different part within the organization or within that, that group as well. I mean, it, there are a lot of ways to volunteer. Absolutely. And by asking those specific questions will allow you to be able to make a, an informed decision because it sounds as though you may be hesitant, that the Claudia may be a little bit hesitant about whether or not she wants to formalize that relationship. Yeah. And yeah. volunteering is a wonderful way to find out more about the organization, to become closer to the organization, understanding how it operates, the nuances and how your skill set may be advantageous for the organization's benefiting and moving its cause forward. Yeah, I mean, Claudia, good luck on this. I mean, if you think about the for-profit world, think about how many internships turn into regular positions. And I mean, it's kind of like a dating environment and it's somewhat controversial, um, especially if you're not being given a stipend or, you know, it, it's kind of like free labor. That's not good. I don't advocate that. But I think there is something to be said for kind of, if you will, dating <laughs> Absolutely. Think of it as a, a not quite a speed date, but an opportunity <laughs> to date short term or long term. And you definitely are the gatekeeper on the length of that relationship. Yeah, I like that. I think that's really cool. Well, Claudia, let us know what happens. I, I really I'm so I'm so curious. I really am. I I think that this is a time of a lot of change um, in our country with so many people shifting jobs and and shifting even sectors that they work in so could be kind of exciting okay let's go to another question shonda and this is coming to us oh name withheld you know how i love name withheld <laughs> <laughs> from chicago illinois i've been asked by one of our development officers to attend a meeting with a prospective donor honestly i'm freaking out i am not confident that i can do right the right thing in this meeting also, it would crush me if I did something wrong that resulted in the loss of a donation. Wow. Okay. okay my heart just kind of like breaks for this person. I know. Um, this is um, very interesting once again, and mm -hmm. I will dissect that one. And I will say that first and foremost, if your development officers have asked you to attend, they have confidence that you can add value to the meeting. Yeah. Secondly, I will say, ask them to share any information about that donor that they've already prepared, because obviously they have prepared for the meeting and ask, how would they like for you to contribute to this, to the conversation and what value they'd like for you to add as they are um, meeting with the prospective donor? Uh, last but definitely not least, there are a variety of resources that are definitely available to help you prepare for your first meeting. Um, the Fundraising Academy offers a wonderful portal, of all kinds of pre pre presentation preparation material that you can look at and prepare within your role about key things that you may want to bring along to add value to the presentation that your development team has already provided, um, adding specific details about how your program has um, succeeded, um, its challenges, and how the donor can help bridge that gap. So do not be... Um, don't be too cautious. Don't be too afraid because trust me, your development team has confidence in you and that's why they invited you to the table. 
You know, I love that you said <clears throat> that because I hadn't thought of it that way. When I read this question, I thought, oh, this is somebody from a uh, program. Mm hmm definitely. And then, and they, they want like, um, so what is it you do over there? <laughs> you know, what is Right. it you do in that building or with those people or, you know, and, um, but I love that you said that development, development people, they're in sales and they're not Absolutely. going to do anything to jeopardize their sale. And And they know apparently the person in this particular role will only add value to that presentation. And as a person that works in program, you are more valuable than you probably can ever imagine because you're closest to the cause. You are the implementer, you're the overseer, and you would have statistical information, specific examples that perhaps your development team may not have that can speak to the passion and the interest of the prospective donor. And you would be able to provide that linkage that they may not have in providing specific examples or instances. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's really powerful. I think it's powerful to know, as we say, boots on the ground, that person, like that, the teacher that's working with the kids in the school versus the principal or the administration, you know, what does that look like? What does the musician feel when they're in the pit of the orchestra versus talking to, you know, maybe the, the leaders of a, of a symphony? There's a, there's a lot of different things and different perspectives. And so I think this is really cool. And, and I agree with you. Be confident and be honest and just share what your, what your life looks like. And maybe, you know, run through with, as you mentioned, run through with the development team about what should I expect? What do you want me to say or not say? How can I be a part of this in a valuable way? Absolutely. And, you know, many instances, some development officers will practice what they're going to say in preparation for a presentation with the prospective donor. And this is where you have an opportunity to kind of hone in and identify what are those critical areas that you really want to emphasize as you're talking to the prospective donor? What are the specific questions that he or she may have? And you can prepare for those questions. Now I'm going to add a question back onto you, Ms. Shonda. You work with a college um, in your day-to-day -day world. Have you ever taken a student um, to meet with a prospective donor? Absolutely. And I've also done the opposite and had donors meet perspective, meet students that have been beneficiaries. And that is the most compelling response that you can ever have. We talk about fundraising is both heart and science. And so with that, donors, you know, you want to capture their hearts. And the best way to do that is by telling authentic stories about how their gifts are impactful. And there's nothing better than for them to meet a beneficiary or a prospective beneficiary so that they can actually realize how their gift can add value to your organization and further your cause. You can never go wrong with introducing a beneficiary or benefactor um, to a prospective donor and or a donor who's already contributed to the organization. In fact, in my opinion, it helps strengthen the relationship. I think that's super cool. And I think it's kind of like, I don't know, what do you think? We don't do that enough. We do not. And Well, that's why? one of the most authentic and easiest ways to engage and cultivate and strengthen the relationship. And it comes from an authentic place. I can recall many instances where I connected students with donors and they were beyond elation, you know, and being able to connect with them and not only from the vantage point of knowing that this is the scholarship recipient I'm helping, but, <laughs> excuse me, but also discovering that they have some common attributes with the recipient of the scholarship. I can recall a particular instance where there was a donor whose parent was a single parent and she struggled um, financially. However, because of academics, she was able to become successful and to learn that one of her beneficiaries was also um, the product of a single parent household only strengthened that relationship and made her more compelled to want to give more, knowing that there were additional students out there like her that she could support and identify with. So definitely you want to introduce um, all facets of your organization to prospective donors so that they can see, feel, touch, and have those tangibles, as well as feel that intrinsic value that is brought forth through someone that has benefited from the program. Yeah, I agree. Super cool. Well, thank you for sharing that because I think that's that actually even adds more to the answer um, from for the for that person. Good luck, name withheld in Chicago, um, because 
That's pretty powerful. You're going to be it great. Is. You're going to be great. Be confident. Hey, another name withheld from San Francisco. Um, I got to tell you, I took this name off. San Francisco, <laughs> San Francisco is a big city, but it's not that big. Not that big. Okay, so this person wrote in and wrote, I'm being recruited for a development position in a nonprofit, but a different sector. I've been successful in the arts and culture space. This new job would be so different, and it is in human services. Do you think I would have issues changing to such an extreme service sector? Wow, that is a great question, and I'm glad you withheld that name, Julia, because in this particular instance, you want to have a little bit of anonymity as you're being recruited. Um, the last thing you want is your current employer to feel any sense of urgency or threat. Yeah. With this question as well, I will dissect one part at a time. First and foremost, you know, for me, fundraising is all about mission, passion, purpose. What is your mission? What is your passion? What is your purpose? And does your profession, the organization that you work for, align with those things and are in sync with who you are as an individual? Mm -hmm. We talk about authentic engagement and it begins with ensuring that you believe in your cause. So if you believe in your cause, then I do not see it being a difficult transition because fundraising is fundraising across the board. Again, it's an art and a science and it's applicable in all facets. However, the question is, are you passionate about human services in this particular area of human service? Yeah. It's really, I, and you know, San Francisco is at the center of a really strong human services crisis. I mean, it is, it's, it's almost ground zero. Um, and me being in the West, you know, we hear about this every day. It, it's really a problem. Um, it, it's a problem in many cities, but San Francisco is, is struggling mightily. Um, so, wow, it's a different, different world. And I got to say, and I don't know what you think about this, LaShonda, and this might seem a little controversial, but it seems to me the folks that would be the patrons of arts and culture are not necessarily going to be the patrons of human services. And, and I know that seems unkind and, and not very charitable, but um, having done both, been on boards of, of both sides, um, it's not, I mean, the foundations, yes, but the individual donors, exactly, the, those roles don't always, you know, overlap, at least in my community. So you're absolutely right, Julia. You brought up a very valid point, and that is the donors will not be the same because the interest will be on the opposite ends of the spectrum. And so obviously there'll be a shift in your paradigm or you'll have to pivot your approach. However, again, thinking about the donor cycle, all of it is relevant no matter what particular sector. However, the approach is going to be different and you'll be dealing with different types of donors. And so with that, when you're thinking about transitioning into a different sector, I would highly recommend doing some research on the various types of donors that support that organization and what are the best methods for engaging those types of donors. Because again, as Julia Pot pointed out, arts is quite different from human services. And so you'll be learning a little more technical things as it relates to those human services and the types of events that you'll host will be quite different and your engagement strategies will be different. But in essence, when you're talking about the donor cycle and the model in itself, it'll be the same, but you will use a different approach to catering to that particular demographic sector that you're working with. Mm -hmm. you know, but I would highly recommend before even getting involved in that process, because this is still at the recruitment stage, is to do a lot of research on the organization to ensure that your comfort level is there. And because there is some hesitation, that is a great opportunity for more discovery. You know, it makes me think about the cost selling cycle and talking about pre-discovery and identifying what approach you will take with the various donors. And so I would definitely say that if it's something you're interested in transitioning into to secure some additional um knowledge so that you're you're prepared to be successful you know it's so funny I and mean, life is kooky but i i was just in uh san Fran the san francisco airport a week ago and they had a, a little museum space tiny tiny and it was in celebration of uh san francisco opera's 100th anniversary and um it, it's a fabulous if you if you just can discover it it's just this fabulous little jewel of a time capsule 
of how the city a hundred years ago made a commitment to being a cultural center mm. and, and of the West, really of the U S but spe specifically the West and what they did and how they did it. Um, it it's riveting, but I, I like what you just said, because I hadn't really thought of that is to understand the culture and the history on both sides to see if you can fit into that. And again, marry your passion. Because if you have to slog it through a job, you know, and not have that passion, that's brutal. Exactly. And it can make it, it can be very exhausting and it can be unfulfilling. And one of the things that donors automatically pick up on is they can perceive how you feel about your employment and they can feel whether or not you're passionate and enthusiastic about your cause. And so you don't want to do a disservice for yourself nor the organization and accept a position that you're not comfortable in. And obviously, again, there will be a learning curve. However, most importantly is does that human services organization align with your mission, passion, and purpose. I've been intentional throughout my career and worked in higher education because education is definitely a pathway for economic empowerment. And so it's easy for me to speak to that cause because I've been a bit direct beneficiary of the value of education. So I've, I've accepted roles that make it very seamless and effortless, um, as well as identified institutions that al align with my fundamental um, philosophy as far as education is concerned and equal opportunities. Okay, so then this next question is like totally um, perfect. This I could not I could not have set this up. This is like the dream situation. Oh wow! <laughs> this question it, it, it's it's from Chandra, <laughs> and it's again City Withheld, and it says this is a question for Lashanda. You seem very confident. How long did it take you to develop such confidence in your career? I want to do development and ultimately be an executive director but I'm miles away from being so confident. That's an, oh, honest, wow. that's an honest question. That is definitely an honest question. Thank wow. you for saying that um, I seem very confident. Just like everyone else, I do have hesitations um, and anxieties about a variety of different things. So first and foremost, thank you for saying that I appear confident. Confidence is something that does happen over time. I've always been a, a talker. And as a matter of fact, as a kid, I can be, I can recall being called Pac-Man. So I've never been short in communication skills. Okay. So being able to be an effective communicator is very important as you're thinking about entering the philanthropic space uh, with confidence and it takes time. And so I have practiced through the years. I've participated in numerous presentations. I've attended numerous trainings. Um, the confidence level for present presenting varies from person to person. But I will say, get started sooner rather than later. And there, there are a variety of different ways that you can secure practice. You can attend conferences. You can join Toastmasters. Um, the Fundraising Academy has a wonderful portal. And we, ha we have a series that talks specifically about preparing for presentations and the types of ways to prepare for presentations, depending on the type of donor that you'll be interfacing with, which is a wonderful resource. Um, in addition to that, talk to yourself in the mirror. Um, you are your greatest critic, okay? So talk to yourself in the mirror um, and that in itself will help you. And I would definitely say identify a mentor and a mentor can be very helpful because he or she can provide you with a pathway to help you with um, aligning your career goals with actualizing them. Um, in many instances, many professionals enter the development sector by happenstance. However, it sounds as though you're intentionally going to pivot. And so with that, identify someone who um, has acquired the skills that you're currently seeking, that's willing to help coach you along the way. But most importantly, confidence also comes from within. And because you know your mission, you know your passion and your purpose, allow it to radiate through your personality in all that you do. Being your authentic self will allow others to perceive you as confident. And that is who I am all day, every day. And so with that, I say you have a confidence that you've yet to unveil. Wow. Okay. That's the hour power, everyone, or power hour, I should say. I really love what you just said. And I think I never drew the line between authenticity and confidence. Mm. So that's cool. That I, I appreciate that. The understanding that when you are who you are and you can accept that and be confident or, or that builds confidence, if that makes sense. 
Is that it what definitely, it definitely say? does. Yeah. Like, and I completely attest to that. Um, we often talk about, you know, as an African-American development professional, there's, you know, code switching and things of that nature that comes up in conversation. But needless to say, with code switching, even with that, you have to maintain being your authentic self and being your authentic self, meaning that being true to who you are, no matter what space you're in, but also being able to move through the various spaces, as we mentioned in the previous question, transitioning from the arts to human services, the conversation and dialogue will be a little different, but maintain your authentic self and what your values are and applying them in your day-to-day -day workplace. And confidence will be unveiled through your conversation, also through you know researching and being very knowledgeable of the content area that you're discussing that also provides additional support for building confidence right you know i would love i'm going to put you on the spot i would love to have you come on and do um uh an episode with us on code switching within that lens of fundraising i think that would be riveting for for everybody to under to to, to have that conversation um so again i'm putting you Bye. on the I think I do Put that. Put me on blast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely would love to engage in that yeah. conversation. You know, it comes up very often, but it's not something that we talk about in the public space. It's more of the sidebar conversations, but definitely code switching is something to be discussed as we talk about the philanthropic space. Yeah. Okay, sister, I'm putting you on that list because I think that would be a super cool thing. Um, I really, really do. And and I think you're, you, um, I think you're so beautifully representative of all the good things that go on in development to, to layer this in and have this discussion would be really powerful. So I'm holding you to that. <laughs> do that. Do that. Please. <laughs> well, yeah. Hey, again, That'd LaShonda Williams, amazing, amazing. One of the, like, I always call her one of the, the people in the brain trust, um, a trainer at fundraising Academy. You can check out fundraising-academy.org and through there, you'll find this portal that LaShonda is speaking about. So many free resources, um, so many different tracks for whatever place you find yourself in this philanthropic journey, whether you're a board member, you're somebody in development, like the question we had about somebody wanting to navigate into development. What does that look like? You know, LaShonda, I've always believed that fundraising is is from you know the day porter janitor to the receptionist to the ceo it's not just those people that sit in those offices over there it's everybody's business and so um i think you can we can always be learning right and and trying to figure out how we can help the organization and so for me that's what fundraising academy does it's not just for the development folks it's it can be for everybody Exactly. Building a culture of philanthropy begins within the organization and every person within that organization plays a vital role from the moment that they step into your building and whether or not the floors are clean, whether or not it has a fresh aroma, that person who works in custodial services plays an integral role in the perception and the brand of your organization. The person who answers the phone, whether they're pleasant or less than pleasant, uh, will definitely provide a perception of your organization. So no matter how large or how small the role or how much time is spent engaging the donor specifically or how little time, but it all at the end of the day impacts the donor's experience. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, fundraising and development is all encompassing of everyone that, because each role is very vital to the success of the organization and furthering your cause. Undoubtedly. Well, hey, this has been another episode of the Nonprofit Show. Um, LaShonda, I always pick the day that I'm going to be on because Jarrett and I switch. When I know you're going to be on, I'm always like, no, no, I want to be on because I always learn so much and I love our conversation and uh, your energy. Um, and again, thank you to our sponsors that allow us to have somebody like LaShonda Williams come on and share her magic and her um, intention with us. And those folks really that are with us day in and day out include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Amazing, amazing way for me to start my day. For some of you watching this, you might be ending your day, but LaShonda Williams, thank you so much. 
Thank you for having me and I look forward to the next time. And I hope that we answered your questions in a way that is meaningful, thoughtful, and allow you to move forward in your profession. Absolutely. I think you have. I, I always learn something from you. And I also, I think I'm always also imbued with a sense of wonderment, but possibility and confidence. Like our last question, I think you give me confidence in what the sector is doing because it's so positive. So um, thank you so much, my friend. Hey, everybody, we end every episode with this mantra, and that is to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here again next time. LaShonda, thank you. Thank you, Julia. See you next time. 